Top Bird Talk. Next, we are delighted to introduce Liam Humphreys, who works in Sheffield with Rob Copeland's group, where there is a clinical prehab service. And his background is in sports psychology, but has moved towards the psychology of behavioural change and psychological support in prehabilitation. And is going to discuss what's important in psychological intervention. Is it psychological or behavioural that is the key element? Thank you, Denny. So uh, my name's Liam Humphreys. I am a senior research fellow at Sheffield Hallam University, part of Professor Copeland's team at the Advanced Wellbeing um, Research Centre. So what we're going to do today is explore this idea of what's more important in prehab, behavioural change or psychological interventions. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to delve into the uh, definitions of both sides of these interventions, the differences, some of the evidence as well, and also then to hopefully try and answer the question that the presentation actually offers. So as we all know, everyone in this room, cancer diagnosis is a very traumatic event for anybody that has to go through that. And researchers said that in terms of preparing for treatment, roughly 30 to 50% of people will have some degree of psychological uh, symptoms following their diagnosis. There's also research that shows that uh, anxiety, depression and distress leads to impaired wound healing and also increased post-operative complications leading up post, post-surgery. But there's also correlated as well that a higher level of self-efficacy in patients, a low preoperative pain expectation and also a general optimistic outcome correlates with a lower risk of adverse surgical outcomes. So these findings show that having some um, psychological support and building people's um, resilience could have a really positive output on people as they go through their treatment. So in terms of some of the data on this, so there's a a scoping review by Hanalis Miller in 2022, who looked at 44 prehabilitation studies. The graph on the left side there looks at which is the most popular form of psychological support and psychoeducation was quite far ahead. And some of these examples have been discussed today, which would look at like surgery school is a good example of this, where you are preparing people for what's ahead in terms of their treatment. Now, all of these studies involved in this scope review showed an improved immediate post-operative psychological, physiological, and also immunological outcomes. Now, the problem was, and this has come up several times today, that there was considerable heterogeneity in the research that was used uh, within these studies and also a lack of intervention and uh, detail of what they actually did to support those patients through that leading up to their treatment. Now this was supported by another review which was a review of reviews and this was from Grimmett et al in 2022 and again they found that there was a trend towards positive outcomes for patients going through psychological support. The issue that they had again with this was the fact that they lacked the detail So although this is certainly a promising area for patients receiving psychological support, but what we're finding so far is that it lacks the what, where, when, who, and how much in terms of intervention details. We'll move now on to behavioural change, so shaping actions and and habits. So in terms of behavioural change, in my opinion, it's a fundamental aspect of of prehabilitation. It is about, um, well, obviously we know behaviour change is complex, and it's about modifying a person's actions, habits, and routines try and get them to enact a behavior, normally a health behavior that we want them to action. So numerous studies have shown that behavior change, a lot of it's about active ingredients, which are the behavioral change um, techniques, which I'll go through in a little bit more detail in a couple of slides time. But it's also about focus on actions and habits. So behavior change aims to be, to be about tangible, measurable improvements in a person's life. So in terms of the, the research in this area, so as part of the development for the prehabilitation guidelines. I was part of the team that did the um, narrative synthesis for the psychological and behavior change um, aspect of the the guidelines, which was led by, again, by Professor Copeland. And again, education was the the highest in terms of the the most common sort of psychological um, intervention. And within this, so we had 182 primary um, studies, which included 32 studies that had some aspect of psychological support and also behavior change. So in in combination. And once again, these studies, they did not map the interventions that they did or include some kind of taxonomy. And the use of behavior change theory was used scarcely within these studies. So it's hard to know exactly what they're actually delivering and and how they decide on those interventions. So in my opinion, work is urgently, urgently needed to map behavior change techniques within prehab. So we can also get an idea of 
the um, what behavior change that they're using. And this also comes from the NICE guidance as well, which states that behavior change should be explicit about what they are delivering in, the, in their interventions and what the theory of change that they're actually using and also explain how it works. So this will probably be familiar because it was a, it came up earlier. So this is one of the examples that people can use when they are designing their intervention, which is about trying to target a person's capability, opportunity, and motivation in order to get them to enact behavior or change their behavior. So this is the COMB model, and it is the central component to the behavior change wheel, which was developed by uh, Mickey and colleagues, which, put, which has 19 different behavior change frameworks combined within the model. And the behavior change wheel incorporates behavior change theory to provide a systematic framework for intervention to the designers to develop a, a behavior change uh, intervention. I also want to touch again, I, I mentioned the theory of change a second ago, because in my opinion, the best interventions are underpinned by clear theories that explain the what, explain the why, and also explain the who. I wanted to sort of answer when you're designing an intervention is being able to ask these questions is why is the intervention needed? What is the intervention? What does it need to do? And why is the intervention important? And what will it achieve? And um, so these are the sort of things to help us uh, design. And the COMB model and the behavior change wheel can be applied to these as well to make it quite a robust process. I also mentioned briefly the behavior change techniques. So there's also the behavior change techniques taxonomy, which again was developed by Michi and colleagues. And this includes 93 different behavior change techniques that people can use within their research. And they are grouped into 16 clusters. Now, it is, there's a whole process of this because there, there is an app there because there's a way that you could, like, you could even code what your intervention is onto these behavior change techniques. But it, it, does, it, it allows us a way of actually mapping what we're actually using within our interventions. But also, something that's come up, uh, in, I think, in every presentation so far today is the personalizing of prehabilitation strategies. So again, the line at the top there, which is from Grimmett and colleagues, we, we talks about how we lack focus in terms of behavioral science within prehabilitation. But also, we need to make sure that these interventions are developed with person-centered approaches. And this will also increase engagement. Now, engagement is key. And it, again, I say it's come up in most of the presentations again, because so we do run the risk of increasing the health inequalities in these sorts of research, where we're only accessing the people that probably would have done, some, done the health behaviors themselves anyway. And the people that could probably stand to gain the most are probably being left left behind. I, I do think that uh, we need to make sure that is something that doesn't happen. So to do this, to personalize prehab, providers can use assessment tools. Again, people have discussed the assessment tools earlier and also develop their interventions um, and plans around the individual that can actually change as that person moves through their prehabilitation. Because we need to remember that each patient is unique. And that person has their own characteristics, their own needs, and their own preferences that need to be considered within, within their uh, prehabilitation plan. So I'll come back to the original question. So what is key for, for prehabilitation? Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to give you a definitive, definitive answer. So what I'm going to say is that, in my opinion, that we need to recognize that they are both mutually beneficial and important within prehabilitation. Because uh, behavior change for me is the engine that drives um, prehab forward in terms of modifying actions and also modifying people's habits. Whereas the psychological interventions address the emotional and psychological aspects of a person going through this, this journey. They help patients to navigate and cope with the stress, anxiety, and challenges that, that they face, helping them to build resilience. So there's a clear interplay here between the two, um, the, the two aspects where we can create a positive feedback loop and also reinforce and sustain healthy behaviors and emotional well-being um, throughout their cancer prehab, but also be beyond their prehab as well, when hopefully they're beyond treatment, when they're moving towards survival, that these healthy habits um, and resilience that they've built will keep going. So I'll put what's next on this slide in terms of my conclusion. And this is for all, as all here as researchers and practitioners as well, is what can we do to improve the, um, the interventions that we are, that we are um, developing? Because for me, both are integral components, each com um, contributing to unique elements of the journey towards well-being. Um, behavior change frameworks and techniques are, are there for us to help people develop healthy habits. And also psychological support is there to help address these physiological, the psychological sorry, factors for, for lasting um, resilience. So for me, what we need to do is start to move, move towards and gain a better understanding of what people want in these sort of interventions. But also for us to start to provide the what, where, when, who, and how much in all of our intervention to make sure that 
we can well, not only can we help our patient but also we can pull our data together so we can actually start to get a, a bigger idea of how our interventions are impacting patients moving forward so thank you for listening Top thanks for downloading Top Med Talk don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher don't forget to check us out on social media we're on Twitter Facebook LinkedIn and YouTube and also don't forget Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioptive medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out ebpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now.